Hello, this is Rick, K6VVA, The Locust, with a look at solving the IOTA QSL problems. Here are what I call the big four. Number one, postal theft. Number two, slow QSLers. Number three, non-QSLers. And number four, invalid QSLs. IOTA QSL problem number one, postal theft. This has become a major problem and often requires repeat QSLing and more green stamps or IRCs and it is frustrating. There are several solution options. IOTA expeditioners who live in countries with known postal theft problems should get a European or USA QSL manager and use OQRS. OQRS means Online QSL Request Service. This saves the cost of sending a QSL, envelope, self-addressed envelope, and green stamps or IRCs one way of the QSL request to recipient process but only reduces theft problems on the return leg. Here's a creative solution used by some QSLers for the return leg envelopes with the requested QSL. This one is from an area known for postal theft problems. Notice the lower right-hand corner of the envelope has been cut off. This allows any corrupt postal employee to quickly see that there is only a QSL and no money inside the envelope. Some of these types of cut envelopes I've received also contain wording like card only, no money, just above the cut corner and sometimes also in another location on the envelope. As I admired this creative approach, several ideas came to mind based upon the way most QSLs were sent and received back in the good old days and the reality of OQRS now in current times. And thanks to OQRS, we can return to the good old days for both international and domestic USA QSL cards. Here is one of my favorite QSL cards from back in that era. A clever and quite appropriate design on the front for the island location. On the back, note the postmark date, 5 January 1961. And look at the 3 cent U.S. postage stamp. Those days are gone forever. With the current domestic USA postcard rate being 33 cents and due to go up perhaps another 3 cents in January 2014. Many other old-timers will remember the typical QSO details section on the left side of the card and address block on the right. If I sent my QSL shortly after the QSO on 19 November of 1960, that was still a pretty fast turnaround considering the mail routing through Hawaii and out to Perry Island in the Inuitok Atoll and back during the busy holiday mail period. Using OQRS, this type of return direct card method will substantially reduce postal theft problems. But there is another benefit. Using current USA domestic rates for QSLing here within the USA, sending a QSL inside an envelope requires a 46 cent stamp. This is projected to increase to 49 cents in January 2014. Comparing the current 46 cents to the postcard rate of 33 cents, that's a savings of 13 cents per QSL in return postage cost, not to forget the extra savings of envelope cost. While this may not seem like a lot, for 5,000 IOTA Expedition QSLs, just the postal savings alone would be 650 U.S. dollars. And that is a lot. So instead of spending time cutting the corners off of 5,000 envelopes, looking at the backside of this QSL, it would be very easy to insert a typical QSO details label into pre-printed text on the left side and an address label on the right. With today's printer technology, QSO details and whatever text is desired, along with the address info, can both be printed directly onto the back of the QSL. That's another time savings for the IOTA Expedition or Aura QSL Manager. But wait, there's more. In addition, modern technology also provides the ability to print postage directly onto the QSL, at least here in the USA and some other countries. What a huge time savings in processing direct QSLs and reducing postal theft problems too. This warrants serious consideration and is a direction I am likely to pursue for my own IOTA Expedition QSLing. But what about all those double-folded QSLs? Reality check. Postage rates in the United States will go up, up, up. Rather than keep giving unnecessary money to postal systems, ditch the double-sided QSLs and use the money to fund more and more IOTA expeditions. Yeah. In reality, most of the double-sided QSLs I've received have so much weeny little printing on them, I have to get a magnifying glass to read it anyway. Just refer people to a website URL on the QSL instead. IOTA QSL problem number two, slow QSLers. 
Don't you just love it? When right after working a new IOTA, you fill out a QSL card, address a mailing envelope, add a stamp, and insert your card along with a self-addressed return envelope in green stamps or IRCs, mail it the next day, only to still be sitting with no return QSL eight months or longer down the road? There are several solution options. The first one is two words, QSL Manager. If an IOTA expeditioner cannot process QSL requests on a timely basis, get a friggin' QSL Manager, preferably one in Europe or the USA. And three more words, please use OQRS. IOTA QSL Problem Number 3, Non-QSLers. Don't you just love it when you've worked a new IOTA, gone through all the steps you did for the slow QSLers, but 18 months later still no return QSL? So you send another QSL, green stamps or IRCs, once or twice, only to never receive a QSL? There are several solution options. QSL Manager, preferably in Europe or the USA. If the person won't do that, then they should be placed on an official RSGV IOTA NQ, non-QSL or list. If there were a way, they should also be banned from any future IOTA expeditions. Everyone should boycott working these flakes. Why work them if they won't send you a QSL card? Let them CQ, 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 with no replies. IOTA QSL problem number four, invalid QSLs. So what is an invalid QSL? Well, it's a bummer if you get one. It has either a hand-printed expedition call sign and or a hand-printed island name on the QSL. Neither of these are allowed for IOTA credit. Invalid QSL cards are disappointing, irritating, often costly to fix, and a pain in the you-know-what. For me, the last eight months have been like an IOTA version of whack-a-mole. After dealing with one invalid QSL, another invalid QSL showed up. And after that, yet another invalid QSL. And even two invalid QSLs at once to be dealt with. Some IOTA expeditioners need to wake up. IOTA chasers spend a lot of time and money attempting to get valid QSLs to submit to their checkpoints to get credit for IOTA awards. Invalid cards don't qualify for IOTA awards. Attention, IOTA expeditioners, please understand all the requirements for a valid QSL. Either a hand-printed expedition call sign and or a hand-printed island name on the QSL are no good. These do not work. A fix for home QSLs used by some IOTA expeditions is with a properly completed QSL label like this one. Note the call sign on the label indicates the portable identifier, the officially formatted IOTA designator, and the island name. Again, the expedition call sign, official IOTA designator, and island name. The layout of all these on the first line makes it easy for any IOTA checkpoint to quickly verify the card for credit. Of course, included is the recipient call sign, two-way QSO details, and in this case, the use of a QSO verification stamp across two corners of the label and onto the QSL card itself. If everyone used this type of label layout, it would be easy and simple for checkpoints to efficiently process the thousands of IOTA QSLs they received to validate credit for IOTA awards. Some IOTA QSLs I received required getting a magnifying glass to search all over the card trying to find the weenie printed island name. That's one reason I redesigned the backside of my IOTA Expedition QSLs to put my Expedition call sign, the official IOTA designator, and the island name on one line at the top of the QSL to make it easy and simple for any IOTA checkpoint to quickly validate the card. Now, if I change to this QSL format to eliminate having to use an envelope for reasons already discussed, using a printer for all back-of-card QSO details and the address, including the postage, will eliminate the boring process of affixing labels and postage stamps. OQRS now makes this method possible. In some respects, this is like going back to the future, especially when I look at the potential savings involved over several IOTA expeditions. That's a lot of money that could help offset expedition costs. A bit of related conversation about IOTA awards. Most people know there are three ways for credit, direct QSLs, via the Bureau QSLs, or IOTA contest logs, if the expeditioner or resident IOTA operator submits them. In my opinion, the fact that the IOTA program does not have something similar to Logbook of the World is one reason why there are not more folks involved in IOTA. Here are some facts. 
The DXCC program currently has 340 entities possible to work. The IOTA program has 1,157 islands, not all of which have been activated yet. About 41.2% of all DXCC entities are IOTAs. The numbers show about three and a half times more IOTAs than DXCC entities. DXCC updates made in five years average about 25,000. IOTA updates made in five years are only about 3,300. Sadly, with so fewer entities to chase, DXCC de-expeditioners have many sources to sometimes fund tens of thousands of dollars to expeditions. IOTA expedition funding sources are few. IREF only funds IOTA expeditions for 15% or less claimed status, even though for all the other 85%, these are still considered rare IOTAs for those in need. Reality Check the IOTA program needs more participants to supplement the lack of funding sources, so more IOTA expeditions will be QRV for all to work. A future solution for IOTA funding will require all those seeking credits to share in the expedition funding monetary requirements, possibly on a cost per QSL or perhaps a cost per QSO basis. Considering the cost for direct QSLs, I think one reason more DXCCers don't chase IOTAs can be stated paraphrasing a former president of the United States of America. It's the time required and money, stupid. Based on one's current age, life expectancy, including the SK, silent key factor, the total monetary cost, and certainly the individual stations and antennas, if a DXCCer is now 55 or 60 years old, Starting from scratch to achieve the IOTA 500 award will take 5 to 10 years, and including postage rate increases, cost about $2,500 U.S. dollars for direct QSLing involved. For the IOTA 750 plaque of excellence, it will take 10 to 15 years and cost about $3,500 U.S. dollars for direct QSLing. For the IOTA 1000 trophy, it will take 15 to 20 years and cost about $5,000 for direct QSLing. That's a lot of money spent just to get IOTA QSLs. We need to make it less costly to get IOTA credits in order for the IOTA program to survive. As previously discussed, OQRS can help reduce cost if everyone implements it. Of course, via the Bureau is another option, but it's time for another reality check. Unless everyone implements OQRS, then via the Bureau can take up to two years to get a QSL card. And not every country has a QSL Bureau. Compared to the good old days in the late 1950s through 1970 era, here in the USA, the Bureau system has gone downhill. The ARRL Outgoing Bureau only ships cards four times per year. The incoming W6 Bureau only sends QSLs to the individual card sorters about three times per year. OQRS can reduce postal theft problems, at least one way for direct QSLs. For via the Bureau QSL card request, OQRS also reduces the time delay to receive QSLs, at least for one direction involved, and at zero cost to the requester, just by clicking on an OQRS button. I'll repeat that again, at zero cost to the requester, just by clicking on an OQRS button. Another reality check. All expedition operators still bear the burden of via the Bureau cost for printing and shipping the QSLs. In my opinion, this is not a very fair system to all parties involved. So when it comes to via the Bureau QSL cards, a more fair and reasonable QSL system is needed, like one where everybody pays their fair share cost of a QSL, a system based on QSL printing and all Bureau-related costs. Here's an example. If an IOTA expeditioner activates a new or rare IOTA with 5,000 QSOs and approximately 80% uniques, this equates to a potential of having to send out 4,000 QSLs. When it comes to Bureau QSLs, typically about 45% of all QSL requests are for via the Bureau, which in this example equates to 1,800 QSLs. So if 300 Bureau cards are shipped in batches six times, totaling 1,800 QSLs. Here in the USA, the QSL printing cost, outgoing bureau cost, plus the expenses of shipping to the bureau will cost the single expedition operator almost 400 US dollars, or about 22 cents per QSL. Via the bureau QSLs for five similar expeditions will then cost the expedition operator almost 2,000 US dollars. So added to actual expedition expenses, that's outrageous. Actual costs may vary from 15 cents to 30 cents in U.S. dollars per QSL. A 20 cents per bureau QSL would be fair and reasonable. 
considering all future increases in costs to expeditioners, to make sure we continue to have expeditions to work, in my opinion, a QSL via the Bureau free lunch must come to an end. A fair OQRS Bureau card system can work quite well. If someone does not have PayPal in their own country, you can ask a ham friend with PayPal for their assistance. Of course, the most ideal solution would be like LOTW, Logbook of the World, or what has also been termed paperless QSLing, to dramatically reduce the cost of IOTA awards. It would save all of us a lot of time and money. Yes, expedition operators would need to upload their logs. Reality check again. Unfortunately, the RSGB IOTA program has no resources to implement such systems. In fact, the IOTA program needs volunteer software coders now to help with basic enhancements to the existing computer system. If you can help, please visit the RSGB IOTA website, www.rsgbiota.org. Logbook of the world or paperless QSLing for the IOTA program could eliminate or substantially reduce most of the big four IOTA QSL problems. IOTA has this capability now, but only for IOTA contest logs. Even a fail-safe secure process to download PDF QSL cards, like we can do for PDF IOTA awards, could work. We would simply print the QSLs on our printers and send them to the IOTA checkpoints for credit. The QSL might look similar to this example and have some kind of RSGB IOTA official PDF verification seal or stamp affixed to the image. Our only hope for a paperless IOTA QSL system is for those with the financial means to provide all the funding necessary to make it happen. In other words, we need an IOTA sugar daddy. No, not that kind. This kind. An IOTA sugar daddy philanthropist, or a number of them. Maybe we should all start buying lotto tickets. Another option is for all serious IOTA chasers to contribute funding. Seriously, if you can help, please contact the RSGB IOTA now. The email address is iota.online at rsgb.org.uk. Let's nuke the big four IOTA QSL problems. This will increase participation in the IOTA program, which will increase expedition funding, which means more expeditions and more IOTAs to work for everyone. It's a win-win situation. Of course, to somehow get any type of credit for an IOTA award, you gotta hear them before you can work them. Reality check. Too many IOTA expeditioners are clueless about antennas and propagation, which is why you can't hear them. And with using only 100 watts, they have weak weenie signals. That is a fact, which is why I've started on an educational video titled Antennas and Propagation for IOTA Expeditioners. Stay tuned. Thank you.